you'll be spending at least two lab sessions working with the concept of evolution, and of course it plays a role in almost everything we talk about in biological sciences. It explains both the unity and the diversity of living things. But before we get started, I want you to stop and just write down for yourself, out of your own head, your understanding, just a brief definition of what is evolution. So hopefully you came up with some reasonable definition for evolution, but let's read this one from your textbook in the glossary. Evolution is descent with modification. It's the idea that living species are descendants of ancestral species that were different from the present day ones. And it's also defined more narrowly as a change in the genetic composition of a population from one generation to the next generation. I'd like to point out that language is actually really important in your career field, whatever it is. That being able to use terms in the way that's accepted by those in your career area is going to be critical for communicating with others and for looking like you're well developed as a professional in your area of interest. And so evolution, you may define in a lot of different ways, but let's consider what that definition in the glossary of your textbook says. That it's a change in organisms through time, and that at a strict genetic level, that we're looking at changes in allele frequency from one generation to the next. So we need to be thinking about populations, not individuals. Individuals cannot change their DNA. Or if they do, they're not gonna pass that on to the next generation. Because evolution requires change through time, then we have to be thinking at a minimum over the course of a generation. And of course, many changes over long periods of time can build up to develop into differences in species. It's entirely possible that late in the semester, the lab class may be a little bit ahead of the lecture. Lab class has fewer weeks before it gets to the finish. And I wanted to draw your attention to the fact that there's not just a chapter on evolution in your textbook, but in fact, unit four consists of chapter 22, 23, 24, and 25, all of which are chapters directly related to evolution. And the ones that you'll find most relevant for lab are chapter 22 and chapter 23. So if you defined evolution as being change over time, then you probably were thinking from a Darwinian perspective. So Charles Darwin was the first proponent of this idea in which he actually provided evidence for the theory that he was developing. And at the very same time that he published this, he was also followed by Alfred Russell Wallace, who was a younger biologist discovering exactly the same principles. And so when we think about Darwinian evolution, a lot of times people are thinking survival of the fittest. And sure, that can definitely take place. So in your evolution lab, you're actually gonna be testing survival of the fittest. You're going to model a predator-prey system where the prey are variable as well as the predators being variable in their ability to capture those prey. And I think that you'll see findings very similar to what you would predict in terms of the fitness or ability to survive and reproduce of the prey organisms and the ability of predators differentially to capture those prey. So keep in mind that this is a narrow aspect of evolution, the idea of there being natural selection of predators for prey that are better able to survive, and where the prey are agents of natural selection selecting for more and more efficient predators. Chapter 23 in your textbook covers the evolution of populations, and this is going to more broadly consider the forces or the agents of evolution. So natural selection is not the only process at play. And that's what you'll be learning about when you study population genetics and the Hardy-Weinberg theorem. The idea here is that if there are no evolutionary forces, then the genetic composition of the population should stay the same from one generation to the next to the next. And we would call that equilibrium. In equilibrium, what we should see is no change. So if we draw some axes here, remember that evolution has to happen over time. So we'll make the x-axis, which is the independent axis, time. 
And what we're interested in is different alleles in the population, different alleles of a particular gene. And so let's say that this is going to be percent of the dominant allele. So let's say that a population starts with a frequency of 50% big A, the dominant allele, but that they also have 50% of a secondary little allele, which is going to be the recessive allele. So let's see, if we label our y-axis here, so we go from 0 to 100%, then right about here would be the 50% mark. And what we expect, if we're going to go ahead and graph the frequency of the big A, is no change through time. So that should be a flatter line than it looks, but equilibrium says there's no change, a flat line, from one generation to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. We have 50% big A, that means we also have 50% little a. The allele frequencies do not change. So you'll be learning the conditions that actually result in changes in allele frequency over time. And those changes, you'll notice, are written up in your lab manual. But they're also present on page 486 in this little box at the bottom of the page in your textbook. And let me go ahead and read them to you. So condition one for Hardy-Weinberg, so that things will stay in equilibrium, there will be no evolution. For no evolution, there have to be no mutations. Imagine that you have 100% of allele big M. What happens if there's one mutation? Well, now you have less than 100% of big M. And so that would be a change in allele frequency. There has to be random mating. When mating's not random, some alleles become more common and others become less common. There has to be no natural selection. That's the one on which you're an expert. So there can't be a predator selecting for more and more wary prey. Or there can't be prey that are selecting for faster and faster predators extremely large population size. Just by chance, just due to random factors, strange things happen in small populations. You'll be learning about the bottleneck effect, the founder effect, and other aspects of what we call genetic drift. So for no evolution, so that we do have equilibrium, we need a large population size. And then the final one, number five, is no gene flow. And so we can't have immigrants coming into the population because they bring their alleles with them, that changes the allele frequency. But additionally, there have to be no emigrants leaving the population, taking their alleles with them. So no gene flow between populations. The population has to be isolated, has to be very large. There has to be no natural selection whatsoever. The mating has to be entirely random, not based on anything in particular. And there have to be no mutations occurring. And if all five of those hold true, what we expect it to see no evolution, to just see equilibrium, the same allele frequency from one generation to the next, to the next, to the next.